All right, welcome to lecture. Uh, we'll get started here in just a second. We're picking up uh, chapter 16. I think this stops right around this example. Again, we'll get started in uh, just a second. Continuing on in uh, chapter 16. All right, so again, uh, like usual, if you have any questions, do feel free to uh, type them in, and we'll definitely get to them uh, when I see them. And again, we'll go back if we need to and answer your questions. So we uh, started last time uh, towards the end, chapter 16 here, which is acids and bases. Um, <clears throat> And remember that essentially an acid is something that has the ability to produce H plus ions in solution, while a base is uh, something there that has the ability to produce hydroxide ions in solution. So when we talk about sort of an acid or base, that you know, those are the basic sort of definitions of them. Um, uh, it's really able to produce these free ions in solutions, uh, the free H pluses, uh, the free OH minuses, which would make something, again, an acid or a base. Um, and that's sort of what's a general definition uh, or sort of your basic definition of an acid or a base. Also remember that H plus and H3O plus, when we talk about sort of acids and bases, are essentially the same. So they do really represent sort of the acidic part of the solution. And they are used, as we talked about last time, sort of interchangeably uh, in both formulas and actual chemical equations. So sometimes you'll see the chemical equation written with H+. Plus. Uh, sometimes you'll see it written with H3O+, plus, which is the hydronium ion. And uh, really the main difference is in an equation is if uh, you, for example, use water as one of the reactants, that is typically how you'll get the H3O plus generated. You sometimes can write the same reaction without the water and you'll get the H plus. Um, bases, again, uh, will produce that OH minus and that's typically what we see. As we also talked about, not all bases, for example, necessarily has to have uh, OH minus are in it or hydroxide in the actual formula uh, for something to be a base. So we talked a little bit, I think as well at the beginning here about ammonium, uh, not ammonia, ammonia uh, which is NH3. And again, it does not have OH in it, but it is able to produce OH minus when it reacts with water and it's still considered a base. It's actually a weak base versus sort of a strong base. So we finished up sort of talking about uh, really a, a generic sort of definition of an acid and base and one that people oftentimes think about when we think about acid and base and that's the bronsted lowry definition and in the bronsted lowry definition an acid is a proton donor so it's able to give away that proton while a base is a proton acceptor. So it's able to accept that. And sort of that definition of uh, donor and acceptor creates what are known as acid conjugate base pairs, where an acid on the left-hand side of the equation is related to something on the right-hand side, which is known as this conjugate base. And also a base on the left-hand side of the equation, which is related to a guy on the other side, which is known as this conjugate acid. And the major difference, as we talked about, and really the only difference that there should be when we talk about 
an acid conjugate base sort of pair is basically 1H plus. So that has to be the only difference that you have between an acid and its conjugate base or a base and its conjugate acid in order for those guys to truly be paired. If you have any more difference more than uh, 1H plus, if you have uh, something else that's different, then they are not paired. So it definitely has to be only a difference of 1H plus. So let's take a look at some of that definition here uh, while we look at it. Um, we want to know uh, which of the following pairs are acid-base conjugate pairs. So if we look at the first one, again, the key here to determine if something is a pair is when we compare them both, the difference has to be only, again, that 1H+. plus. So it's got to be that 1H plus difference. And when you look at the difference between these two guys, you should hopefully be able to see that, yes, the only difference here is 1H+. Plus. Now, you can look at that and see that by either taking the H plus off of the HClO4. When you take the H off, you're left with ClO4. And remember that when you take the plus away, you become one more negative. So that's how we get to ClO4 negative. Or if you want, you can look at it the other way where you go, okay, I got my ClO4 negative. And if I add my H plus to that, I pretty much get HClO4. So always a 1H plus difference. So it looks like number one here would be a pair. Number two, now you may be tempted when you look at number two there to think that it is a pair and the difference is 1H plus. So there is definitely a difference here of 1H plus. But there is also a difference of an O, an oxygen. So the guy on the left there does not have oxygen, which is hydrochloric acid. The guy on the right does have oxygen, and that's actually hypochlorite. And because there is a difference of more than just 1H plus, there's that oxygen difference. Number two would not be a pair. So it's really important that the difference is only and only an H plus. So because there's also that oxygen difference, those two are not really related to each other and they would not be considered pairs. When we look at number three here, H2PO4 minus and HPO4 two minus, again, these guys would technically be pairs. There is a difference of 1H plus and 1H plus only. There's still one P on both sides, four oxygens on both, and the difference is, again, 1H plus. That's why the first guy goes from minus 1 to minus 2. Again, when you lose that plus, you become one more negative, and you end up as HPO4, 2 minus. So number 3 would be a pair, and number 4 here would also be a pair so number four, again, if you take off the H from the nitric acid, which is the HNO3, you are left with NO3. And again, when you take the plus out of there, you become one more negative. So we go to NO3 negative. So it looks in this example that number one is, number three is, and number four is, number two, not a pair in this case, yeah? Any questions on how to identify those? So one, three, and four would be acid conjugate base pair. Again, the only difference being one H plus. Any questions on that? Okay, so I think you have some examples next. So for each of these guys that are here, for each of the four, you wanna write the conjugate base. So think about uh, what that would be. Again, a reminder just to help you out there. We have an acid plus a base. Gives you a conjugate base plus a conjugate acid. And again, the partners are these two. And the partners are those two. All right, so see what you come up with. Take a minute or two and figure it out, and we'll go over it.
Okay, so let us take a look at this. So the major thing that you should hopefully know at this point is if we're looking to write sort of an acid conjugate base pair or a base conjugate acid pair, again, as I mentioned, the only difference is 1H plus. Yeah. Now the key is to determine should you put the H plus on or should you take it off? So the relationship that's on the top of the screen there and between the partners will oftentimes help you sort of decide that. So for example, in this case, we are looking to write the conjugate base. And that means that we're ultimately looking to end up with this guy over here, which is our conjugate base. And again, that means that its partner on the other side would be the acid sort of working backwards. So again, that means that all these guys are acids. And again, the definition of an acid is something that will donate an H plus, right? Well, again, a base will accept it. So what that means is each of these guys, because they are technically acids, should donate the H plus. So when our first guy donates the H plus, he's going to be left with one hydrogen. He's going to be left with the salt to a minus one charge. Again, here, we when we lose that plus, we become one more negative. So we'll go from H2S to HS minus. Now, continuing down to the next one, which is HS minus. Again, since this is still going to be a acid, we're going to donate that H plus. And when we do that for this guy, we will be left with just a sulfur. And again, with the plus, he becomes one more negative. So he goes from minus one to minus two because again of the plus that's lost there. Again, every time you lose that plus, one more negative is basically what you become. Any questions on those first two? All right, so continuing on our NH3, again, we've established that all these are going to be acids. Yeah, so the basic Bronsted Lowry definition of an acid is something that will donate an H. So that means if you can identify these things as an acid, you should actually take the H plus away. And vice versa, if you can identify something as a base, then you should have it accept an H plus, which is the other definition there. So when we look at the NH3, again, we're going to take away the H plus in this case. And again, that's going to leave us one nitrogen, leave us only two hydrogens. And again, it started out with no charge. When you lose that plus, you become one more negative. So it will be NH2 minus in this case. And lastly, our guy on the bottom there, again, going to lose an H plus. So that's going to leave us one H, an S, an O, and a three. And again, we're going to become one minus in this case. So sometimes it's really helpful to, especially when you're asked to write either the conjugate acid or the conjugate base, uh, to sort of think about it backwards. So when you think about it backwards, the way we could sort of, in this particular example, know that we should treat these things like an acid is we were asked to find the conjugate base. And the conjugate base, if you work backwards, its partner is an acid and that would tell us that each of these things should be considered an acid and we should then do what an acid does and that is donate an H plus. Just like if you were asked to write the conjugate acid, you would work backwards and know what you're starting with is a base and the definition of a base would then mean that it should accept an H plus. So let's take a look at something like, uh, for example, H. CO3 minus. Why don't you do the conjugate acid for that? And why don't you do the conjugate base for that as well? So take a moment here, write the formula for the conjugate acid starting with HCO3 minus, and write the formula for the conjugate base starting with HCO3 minus as well. And then we'll talk about it.
All right, so let's take a look at this. So again, the best way to sort of do it is to use sort of like the top relationship up there and think about it backwards. So let us start with the conjugate acid. If we're starting with the conjugate acid in this particular case, that means that if we kind of go backwards in terms of our relationship, we see that the conjugate acid is here. And that means that his partner is a base. So in this case, the HCO3 minus would act as a base, which means it would accept an H plus. So we actually would be putting on the H plus in this case, and its partner would be H2CO3. When we put on the H, we get H2 plus one for the plus and minus one gives us no charge. So that would be the conjugate acid to HCO3 minus if it was acting as a base. Now, if we did the conjugate base, again, as we did in the previous examples, the conjugate base means that what we would be starting an acid, which means in that case, it should actually donate an H plus, and that would get us CO3 to minus in that particular case. So again, you do wanna kind of think about these things backwards. It'll help you determine what you should do. The one thing you should know for sure is always when you're doing these sort of acid conjugate base pairs, the only difference again should be that one H plus. And as we see here, as we go from the acid to the conjugate base, that's one less H plus. And as we go from the base to the conjugate acid, that is one more H plus. The conjugate acid actually would not have a charge in this case because as we went from uh, here to here, we added an H plus, which means when we add the H to it, we get H2CO3. And then we have a minus one plus a plus one equals zero, basically. So that's why it's neutral in that case. And that's different than when we took it away going the other way to the base. When we took away the plus, again, you become one more minus, and that's why it went from minus one to uh, minus two as we went to the conjugate base. So it is really important when you're sort of doing this as well, again, is to remember that it's not just an H. Sometimes people sort of visualize it as just an H, uh, but it's also that plus. So that plus will have an effect on the overall charge of your conjugate acid or conjugate base. So you wanna make sure that you do take it into account when you're doing it. Now, when we see something like this, which is hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate, it actually can do both things. It could act in certain cases as an acid, and it could also act as a base. And things that can do both of those things are what are known as amphoteric. An amphoteric substance is basically a substance that <clears throat> in certain cases can act as an acid and in other cases can act as a base. And usually you'll come across those things that much like carbonate or hydrogen carbonate here, uh, it has the hydrogen and it has a minus charge. So those guys oftentimes can kind of go both ways like HSO4 minus, which is bisulfate also has the ability to do that. Water as well has the ability to do that. Um, so there's certain things that actually in certain situations can act as an acid and in other situations that same substance can also act as a base. And again, that's what's known as being amphoteric. Any questions on how to obviously correctly write uh, conjugate acids, conjugate bases, identify pairs? Clearly, you need to be able to do that, all those things. All right, so let's talk a little bit about acid strength. Good talk, let's go back, there you go. So when we have an acid, for example, and again, a reminder that the uh, HA here is just a generic formula for for an acid, it's really a monoprotic acid. Monoprotic means that it basically has one H plus to donate. Um, and 
and uh, HA is again just a common sort of uh, formula that's used when you're not necessarily specifically talking about a specific acid or something like that. So basically in this reaction, uh, the forward reaction, our acid is going to donate over to our water, which would act as a base in this case. And again, we would produce H3O plus. The H3O plus would be the conjugate acid to our H2O in this case, while the A minus would be our conjugate base on the right-hand side to our HA. Now, in there's certain cases when you're dealing with acids, when they do break apart, sometimes the reaction will also head in the opposite direction. And some of those products will come back will come back and basically react to make our reactants. And sort of the reverse reaction will occur. And in a situation like this, we get a reversible reaction, kind of like a weak electrolyte. And this is typically what happens in the case of sort of weak acids. Weak acids are really weak electrolytes, which means, you know, they mainly stay together. But are able to produce a little bit of these ions. And again, because they're still able to produce a little bit of H3O plus, they're still considered an acid. Um, but obviously not a strong acid because it will mainly stay together. So that is sort of where we get our differences in terms of strong acid and a weak acid. If the forward direction predominates, maybe not with the giant arrow like that, but basically what that means is we will have a strong acid. It will pretty much 100% break apart into ions. And what you have in solution is everybody on the right-hand side, 100% is what you got over here. You have none of the whole unit still together at that point. And that's really why it's considered a strong acid because as soon as this guy goes into water, he produces a lot of H3O plus or free H plus. He produces a lot of that free H plus really quickly. And because he produces a lot of that is considered a strong acid. And if the reverse reaction sort of predominates, that is what we're gonna see, what we saw at the bottom there. Typically it'll be represented by those arrows heading in both directions. It'll be a reversible reaction. And in that situation, that's a weak acid. So as I mentioned on the last slide there, in solution, this is mainly what you have, which is the whole guy still together. But again, still able to produce a few, I'll say a few, a little bit of free H plus. So because it's still able to produce a little bit of that free H plus, it is still considered an acid. Uh, but again, it's a much weaker acid than say somebody up there on top, which 100% dissociates or ionizes in solution. That's what we talk about when we talk about an acid breaking apart into its ions. We talk about it being ionized or dissociated. And those are two fancy words for basically saying we took off an H plus or an H plus came off basically in solution. So weak acid, still an acid, still able to produce H plus, but will mainly stay together. So a couple of examples, as we'll see as we go through this, for example, HCl, which is hydrochloric acid in solution will 100% break apart into H plus Cl minus. So again, 100% in solution is what you got, producing a lot of that free H plus, as opposed to down here, something like HF, which is hydrofluoric acid, is a weak acid, which when it is in solution will also break apart a little bit into H plus and F minus. But again, a vast majority of it is staying to the left and a vast majority of what you would have in that solution is the HF acid still together in whole units. But again, it would produce a little bit of those H plus and F minuses floating around. Now also sort of a, another couple of important sort of relationships and 
not too important, I guess, for our class really is the first one, um, our first couple here. But if you ever do get off to 1B there, uh, that's a really important relationship in terms of uh, an acid and a base and sort of the relationship to their conjugate partners. So if you have a strong acid or even if you have a strong base, its conjugate partner will be relatively weak. So it's considered relatively weak. And again, outside the scope of our class, uh, again, in 1B is really more applicable. Um, what that really means is the partner, the conjugate acid or conjugate base of somebody that is strong will pretty much be neutral. It will not continue to react with water or anything like that or sort of mess up the pH of the solution. It's considered usually a neutral sort of uh, salt is really what it'll end up being. Now, if you have a weak acid or a weak base, its partner on the other side is relatively strong. And what that means is Again, outside really the scope of this class, uh, what that means is those guys will continue to react and they typically will continue to react with water through a process which is known as hydrolysis. And ultimately what they can do is affect the pH of a solution and basically affect whether or not that solution would be acidic, basic, or neutral. So um, Sort of the relationship between sort of an acid and base and its partner are basically opposite. And what that again means is if it starts out as a strong acid or base, its partner will be relatively weak. And if it starts out as a weak acid or base, its partner will be relatively strong. When we talk about sort of strong acids, here's a partial list of some of those strong acids. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid, couple other ones, uh, HBr, which is hydrobromic acid, is a strong acid. Uh, hydriotic acid is also a strong acid. So, you know, these are some very common sort of strong acids that we come across. Now, something like sulfuric acid is what is known as a diprotic acid. Diprotic acid means that basically two H's will come off, H pluses. By the way, the H pluses do come off one at a time. So really, if we take something like sulfuric acid, the very first thing that will happen is we will drop off that first H plus and we would be left with HSO4 minus. And then really the second thing that would happen is that HSO4 minus. As I make a giant arrow as this pin is really having a delay here. Okay. I'm just going to do our best here. I think it's having a little bit of trouble today, so hopefully he'll get back on track. Uh, HSO4 minus will then drop off the next H plus and make SO4 two minus. And again, it comes off again that H plus one at a time. This is also why when we're talking about conjugate acid base pairs, that when we think about it, the pairs, they do have to be a difference of just one H plus. And that is why this guy and this guy are pairs because the difference is one H plus. That's also why the guy over here, HSO4 minus and SO4 two minus is really a pair. And that is also why sometimes people, when they see these two guys, the H2SO4 and the SO4 two minus, they are not a pair because they are really, as you can see here, uh, like another step down the road from each other. So again, that's why when we talk about acid conjugate base pairs, it is just one H plus at a time. And that is technically because the H pluses do come off just like that. They come off one at a time. And that creates, again, those pairs that have a difference of only one H plus. So sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid, uh, something like HCl or any of those other guys up here, which can lose one H plus at a time, or only has one H plus really lose. Those guys are what are known as monoprotic. 
And something like phosphoric acid, H3PO4, actually has three H's going to come off, and that's sometimes referred to as triprotic, or sometimes it's referred to as well as polyprotic as well. So um, regardless, the same thing with H3PO4, each of those hydrogens would come off only one at a time. As you also might be able to imagine, it is extremely easier to remove the first H plus when you remove the first H plus and you try to remove the second H plus, like in sulfuric acid down here. It gets extremely harder to remove that second H plus. So if you think about it, when you started with the H2SO4, it was neutral. You pop off that H plus, you now have something that's overall negatively charged and you're trying to remove something that's positively charged. It's going to be held a lot tighter and harder to do. And it gets extremely harder to say, remove a third H plus like an H3PO4. When you get to that third H plus, it gets even harder to remove. So a majority of the H plus that usually will come off in diaprotic or triprotic acids is usually that very first H plus that pops off. Any questions on that there? All right. So just a couple of terminologies that we don't get too much into this, uh, but sometimes acids are referred to as oxy acids. And basically oxy acids are basically, it has a hydrogen that's connected to an oxygen. So for example, if we look at, do my best here with what I got going here, it's a little old. So on the left here is acetic acid. On the right is nitric acid. And really what makes each of these an acid is really this part right here, this OH positive. So when it pops off, it's more like just H uh, with no electron on it and sort of deficient in electrons. And again, that OH group is typically in an acid, an oxy acid, uh, sort of where you see it. And remember, a lot of the oxy acids basically will be have those polyatomic ions in it. Those guys that ended in eight or eight, and they typically will have that group that's in that box as part of the acid component, basically. That's really what makes it an acid. All right. Uh, a carboxyl group is uh, this group right here. This is acetic acid, right? Which is basically vinegar. This whole entire thing is a carboxyl group. And it has that C double bonded O and the OH. But it's really that OH part and that hydrogen that comes off, which makes it an acid. Now, as I mentioned before, water itself can act as either an acid or a base. And again, something that has the ability to do that is what is known as an amphoteric substance. And these are two examples, both of which I think we maybe have saw earlier. But in this case, water is acting as an acid, which means it's going to donate its H plus over. The NH3 would act as a base and vice versa on the bottom here. The water is acting as a base, so it will accept the H plus coming in that way. So again, water is essentially an amphoteric substance. It can act as an acid or a base. When two waters get together, they also can act as an acid or a base, and that's essentially what's happening in water. And basically, one could act as an acid, and one could act as a base. So we'll just say this guy is our acid. This guy is our base. And again, when one of the waters accept the H plus, it will produce OH minus uh, from the acid. And obviously, the base will accept the H plus and produce H3O plus. Now, this relationship that occurs in water does create a, a relationship that's important. It's also known as the autoionization of water. And it does give us a relationship to help us 
sort of calculate whether or not we would expect a solution to be acidic, basic, or neutral. And that relationship is what's known as KW. KW is an equilibrium constant, which is basically what is used when we have a reversible reaction. So in a weak electrolyte, we have the reaction going in both directions. Uh, and that's what really this represents. We have the arrow going this way. We have the arrow going that way. We have a forward and reverse direction. And we get an expression that you do need to know, which is basically that Kw equals the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus, and that equals a constant, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And that is a constant for 25 degrees Celsius. By the way, it does kind of change. Oh, that was a big e term. It does kind of change uh, with temperature, but for our purposes in this class and probably most chemistry classes that you take, uh, essentially, um, usually 25 degrees Celsius is usually what you're dealing with. So it's pretty much as a constant that you'd use in most cases. When we do see the little brackets, we talk about concentration. That usually means molarity, big M, which as we were talking about, again, big M is moles per liter. Uh, so that's usually what we mean there. The H plus is really the acid part of the solution. The OH minus is the base part of the solution. And you could actually calculate uh, either the H plus concentration or OH minus concentration. These two guys basically run opposite of each other. So as the concentration of H plus increases, the concentration of OH minus will decrease and vice versa. H plus concentration goes down. OH minus concentration goes, whoops, don't hit the button, goes up. So they're basically opposites of each other. So basically if you calculate it and the H plus concentration is larger than the OH minus concentration, that essentially will mean that the acid part of that solution is bigger than the basic part. And you would expect the solution to be acidic in that case. Now, if you calculate it and the OH minus part is larger than the H plus part, then you would expect the solution to be basic because the basic part is larger. And if they happen to be equal to each other, and at that point, that would mean that each of them would be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And that would mean that it would be a neutral solution. So we're going to get into some calculations here where it's going to be extremely important that you use your exponent button. Yeah? So you want to make sure, again, for all these calculations, that you use that exponent button, that EE button, that EXP button on your calculator. If otherwise, you will find yourself fairly close to the answer, but the exponent part will be wrong. So make sure that you do, when you do all these calculations, use that exponent button. So again, we could compare both of those things. To do the calculation, it's essentially the same calculation regardless of which one's given to you. You basically take 1 times 10 to minus 14, which is a number you always have. And again, that is what KW equals and you divide it by the concentration that is given to you. So again, you always have this number, which is Kw. And you basically divide by the other one. Again, you want to make sure that you are using your exponent button. All right, let's see if we could do some of these graphs. Yeah. All right, so here's four different ones. So for each of these, Calculate either the H plus or the OH minus, depending on which one's given to you, and then determine is it acidic, basic, or neutral. So take a couple of minutes, calculate each of those, either the H plus or OH minus, depending on which one's given, and then determine for each of them is it acidic, basic, or neutral. So take a couple of moments and we'll talk about it.
All right, so let's take a look and see how we're doing. Um, I'm just gonna rewrite it here on the next page, I think. So on the first one, we were given an H plus concentration of 3.4 times 10 to the minus four molar. So we would wanna find the OH minus, and really, again, it is the same calculation, regardless of which one you have. You're going to take that kw which is 1 times 10 to minus 14 and again you always have that number you're going to divide it by what they gave you which is 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4 and that is going to give us an answer and again you want to make sure one exponent button negative button 14 divided by 3.4 exponent button negative 4 and it looks like it gives us something like 2.9 times 10 to the minus 11 and you would want to put the molarity symbol next to it because it is a concentration so you would want the units there first off questions on that calculation again a reminder it may not give it to you in scientific notation on your calculator it may just give you some decimals probably this one it did give you scientific notation now to determine if it's acidic basic or neutral which by the way when you're asked that question about a solution there is only one answer, it's either acidic, basic, or neutral, it cannot be all three together. You wanna to take your H plus concentration and you wanna compare it to your OH minus concentration and you wanna see which one is larger. And in this case, when we compare it, the one that is larger is actually the H plus. Right? The H plus is a larger number than the OH minus. Remember that when you have a negative exponent, it does make a difference that negative because for our H plus, it's only four places to the left, but for our OH minus, you need to go 11 places to the left and put zeros, which makes it a much smaller number. So this guy should be an acidic solution. And again, there's only one answer for that. Any questions on that calculation there? Oops, come back. There we go. Now let's take a look at the next one, which we also were given the H plus concentration. And in this case, we had 2.6 times 10 to the minus eight. And again, we would do the same calculation, which is the OH minus would equal our KW divided by our 2.6 times 10 to the minus eight. And when we do that one, we end up with 3.8 to the minus seven. Again, we would wanna put the molarity on that and we would wanna compare these two. Yeah, it, it's again, I, I think it's, it's just, um, they just have, I think, too many people on. So uh, it was doing that the last couple of days as well. I, I'm with my other classes as well. So I, I think it's just unfortunate. I think we're at a peak time. My other class was right during this time as well. So we're having some issues with delays and stuff like that. So again, the good news is I think the recording, uh, you there's no delays or anything like that. So if you need to go back and look at something, uh, you could go look at it. Um, but I'm getting the same thing on sort of my end when I sort of write this stuff because there's like a little like delay that's happening. So I think there's just a lot of people on at once. I've been, it did that yesterday as well, actually during kind of the same time period as we are right now. Then it got better later on at night. So uh, when we compare these two here, um, we have an H plus concentration that is uh, 10 to the minus eight. We have an OH minus concentration that's 10 to the minus seven. In this particular case, when we compare them, the OH minus is greater than the H plus concentration. And that means that it is going to be basic in this case.
All right. So continuing on, the next one we have uh, OH minus, which is 6.2 to the minus 9. And again, it really doesn't matter which one you're given. We're going to do the same calculation, except we would be solving for H plus here, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which is our KW, divided by 6.2 times 10 to the minus 9. And we would get one point six to the minus six. Again, we would put molar on it to make it a concentration. And comparing in this case, we see that the H plus concentration is larger than the OH minus concentration. And that would mean that this would be acidic here. And our last example, our last example here will be our OH minus is equal to uh, 8.1 times 10 to the minus. So again, uh, same calculation as I mentioned, and that will get us. One point two to the minus twelve. Again, molar, and in this case, our H plus concentration is actually less than our OH minus concentration, and that means it would be basic. Any questions on any of those calculations? <clears throat> so again, in each of these cases, our H plus and OH minus uh, concentrations, one was larger than the other. Uh, where it would be neutral is when they would be equal to each other. So if you use KW, basically, the only way that you'll get uh, the H plus concentration to equal the OH minus concentration is when each of them equals one times 10 to the minus seven. So that technically would be a, a neutral situation in that situation only, technically speaking, which was none of these problems, but that is when you would get a, a neutral solution when they equal exactly the same number. And because the one times 10 to the minus 14 is a constant, it would mean they both would have that concentration. Any questions on how to use KW here? Get that one here. That's in here. Why don't we do one more just to make sure? Forget about what it is. Just figure out the OH minus concentration on this one from the H plus concentration. So take a moment there and do that calculation. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so in this case, we're given the H plus concentration. So as I mentioned, it really doesn't matter which one you're given. You can do the same calculation. 
In this case, we'll do uh, one times 10 to minus 14. Again, make sure you use your exponent button divided by 2.8 times 10 to the minus five. And if we pop all that into our calculator, again, making sure to use that exponent button, uh, you'll get something like 3.6 to the minus 10. And uh, there's that pause that made my X look weird. Try that again here. Let's see if we can clean it up a little bit at least. There we go. And that would be our OH minus concentration. And then obviously we can't compare the two. Oh, that's the slowest box ever. So if we compare our H plus concentration to our OH minus concentration, what we will see here again is the H plus has a larger number, even though it's a smaller exponent, but it's negative. So in this case, the H plus concentration is larger than the OH minus, and that means that this solution again should be acidic in this case. Any questions on how to use KW to figure out the H plus or OH minus concentration? Uh, in terms of rounding, uh, I went off of the original number. Uh, so our original number here, and I think in the previous examples as well, I think there were all two significant figures uh, based on scientific notation. So then the answers, I think, for each of those would end up as two significant figures. So that's usually probably a pretty good rule when you're doing these calculations. Probably rounded to the same number of significant figures as you start with. And again, on your calculator, sometimes it may give it to you, obviously not in scientific notation. You may have a lot of decimals and zero, one decimal and a lot of zeros. Again, it may be easier to write in scientific notation so you don't lose any zeros along the way or anything like that. All right, so let us then skip this example. And let us then talk about the pH scale. So oftentimes when we talk about whether or not a solution is acidic, basic, or neutral, uh, we oftentimes will look at the pH scale. And the pH scale really does run from 0 to 7 to 14. And below 7 towards 0 is acidic. Uh, above 7 to 14 basic. And right there, dead on, technically speaking, dead on seven. I'm going to try my best here. It's going all over the place. Come on. Uh, that would be neutral. And really, the reason why dead on seven is neutral was sort of like from the earlier question. Uh, when we are technically neutral, what that means is H plus concentration will equal the OH minus concentration, and they both will have a value of one times 10 to the minus seven molar. And when you calculate the pH at that point, the pH actually comes to dead on seven. So technically speaking, because those guys would be equal to each other, and because the H plus concentration would have a concentration of one times 10 to the minus seven, Technically speaking, right on that seven there is, is, uh, is neutral. So we'll go with that for our class. Again, it may vary that other people, some people say, well, if it's just slightly over seven, still neutral and stuff like that. So just to make it simple, if it's dead seven, it's neutral. If it's not dead seven, then it's either slightly above seven, which would be slightly basic, or slightly below seven, which would make it slightly acidic. And it, seven is sort of your middle point and towards 14. It becomes more basic. And as you go towards zero, things become more acidic. And to calculate the pH, you can pretty much skip everything on top there. Is this equation here, and the negative is not part of the equation, so it's just this part right here. The pH of a solution is equal to minus the log of the H plus concentration are again, remember H3O plus is the same. So 
you could have, uh, you will sometimes see this guy as the pH equals minus the log of the H3O plus concentration. By the way, the one that we were using just a moment ago with the uh, KW as well, you could sometimes see it written like it was on the screen there that KW equals H3O plus times OH minus, and that equals one times 10 to the minus 14. Again, that H plus and H3O plus can be used interchangeably both in formulas. Now let's talk about calculators and how to do this. If you have a display calculator, you go uh, in this direction, you type it in exactly the way it is. In the display calculator, you hit the negative button, not the minus, the log button, and then you type in your concentration uh, using your exponent button. If you have a non-display calculator, you actually have to go backwards in this formula. And all the rest of the formulas we're gonna talk about, you would actually start with the number, then hit the log button, and then hit the negative button. If you're not sure if you have a display calculator or a non-display calculator, all you have to do is hit the log button. And if it says log, congratulations, you have a display calculator. If it says error, congratulations, you have a non-display calculator. So. Again, display calculators for this formula and all the rest of them, just like it's written, non-display calculators, you need to go backwards when you type all this stuff in, and this formula and all the rest of the formulas. All right. So let us talk about you know everybody's favorite thing, which is significant figures and pH. So when we calculate the pH of a solution, the number of decimal places that we end up with will equal the number of significant figures in the concentration number. So we're going from significant figures in the concentration to decimal places. So not significant figures to significant figures, but significant figures to decimal places. So why don't we try one here? We have an H plus concentration of one times 10 to the minus five. Calculate the pH to the right number of digits. So take a moment and then we'll talk about what the right number of digits is, just to make sure our calculators work. Okay, so to calculate the pH, again, we're going to use the pH equation, which is the pH is equal to minus the log of the H plus concentration. So putting that in, that's minus the log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus five. And on your calculator, it should probably switch you a five. So now the question is, first off, hopefully you got the five. That's the important part as well. Do you write five, write 5.0? Do you write 5.00? Do you write 5.00000000? Oh, it's not, it's not, it's just recording. Let's talk about, look at the concentration of how many here is 5.00. So significant figures, to decimal places, so not significant figures to significant figures, which is what people oftentimes think about. It is significant figures to decimal places. 
So that is 5.00 should be the correct way to display the pH. We would also know that this pH at five means that this solution should be acidic as it is less than seven on the pH scale. So this should be an acidic solution. Any questions on significant figures to decimal places? We will also talk about in this chapter how to go from pH back to the H plus concentration. So the rule applies going both ways. So if we started with a pH of 5.00, it would have two decimal places. Then that means the H plus concentration should end up with two significant figures. So this rule goes both ways. Yeah, so the, the rule is, again, it's not significant figures to significant figures when you're doing concentration to pH or backwards. It's significant figures to decimal places. So the H plus concentration has two significant figures. What that relates to in terms of our pH is not two significant figures, but two decimal places. So that's slightly different. People oftentimes think, oh, it should be sig figs to sig figs. But again, we're going significant figures to decimal places. And again, if you're going backwards, like we will be doing in this chapter, you also follow that rule. Again, decimal places back to significant figures when you go to concentration. Questions on that thing? All right, so let us uh, take a look at an example, I hope. All right, so you got a couple of solutions. So for each of these solutions, calculate the pH. And while you're at it, figure out, are these solutions acidic, basic, or neutral? So calculate both of those and see what you come up with. Take a couple minutes, and we'll talk about it.
Okay, let's take a look at this and see what we got going on. So for our first one, uh, we have the H plus concentration. So that means the pH would equal minus the log of 2.1 times 10 to the minus five. Again, if you have a display calculator, you put it in exactly like that. So you hit the negative button, not to subtract. You hit the log and 2.1 exponent negative five. If you have a non-display, you would start with 2.1 exponent negative 5, hit the log button, and then hit the negative button. And when it's all said and done, 4.68 would be our pH. Here again, we have two significant figures. Gets us, again, not two significant figures, but two decimal places here in our pH value. That again is less than seven, which means it should be acidic. Any questions on that first one there? Now let's take a look at the second one. And for the second one, if you got a pH value of 7.23, that would be wrong. And we're going to talk about why that's wrong right now, in case somebody out there got that. That is because what we are not given the H plus concentration, but we're actually given the OH minus concentration. And remember that to calculate the pH, you need the H plus concentration given to you. And that means before we could actually go into the pH equation times OH minus, that was supposed to be 10 to the minus 14. And that is going to get us a small number there. It's going to get us 1.7 to the minus 7. And now we could go into our pH equation, which would be minus the log of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7. And we will get 6.77 as the pH, which means this guy would also be slightly acidic. Just below seven, yeah? So just below seven. Now, if you were one of the people that kind of uh, ended up with this number here that I crossed out originally, the good news is, although you really did not calculate the pH, you calculated something else. And you're actually just, you know, a couple of slides ahead of us. What you calculated was not the pH because you were given the OH minus. You calculated what is known as the pOH. The pOH is equal to minus the log of the OH minus concentration. So if you did get that 7.23, that would actually in this case be not the pH, but the pOH. The nice relationship though between the pH plus the pOH is that it actually equals 14, which means that if you calculated the pOH below, without knowing it perhaps, you could take the 14 minus the pOH. And if you do that, you would take 14 minus your 7.23, which technically would be this guy, which is the pOH. And lo and behold, you will end up with 6.77 as the pH. So this is also a very helpful sort of calculation as well. It allows you to calculate the pOH of a solution. The pOH scale, as we'll talk about, actually runs opposite of the pH scale. So if you have a high pH, you have a low pOH and vice versa. You have a low pH, you have a high pOH. But sometimes, as you can see, you can kind of quickly calculate the pH from the OH minus 
without having to use KW like we did in the problem. You could have used KW as well and did it like we did in the problem, or you could use that relationship on the top of the screen and calculate the POH, and you would get basically the same answer. So it does give you a variety of ways that you can sort of solve some of these problems uh, depending on what is given to you. So if you're given the OH minus like we were in, in the second part of this problem, you actually could take the minus the log of it, which is the exact same calculation as pH, and that will get you the POH and then subtract 14. So there's a few different ways you could actually get to these answers, and none of them is necessarily right or wrong. Uh, they all get you the same place if you do it correctly. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's see. I think it's probably a good stopping place. So let's talk about a couple of things. Officially scheduled for next Wednesday is our last exam, exam number four, which that would be May 6th. It's May already, huh? May 6th. And again, it's going to cover chapters 14, 15, and 16. But since we have not finished 16, I'm going to make the executive decision and I'm going to move the exam to May 11th on Monday. So we're going to move the exam from Wednesday to Monday. That's okay, I hope. If it's not, that is what's going to happen anyway, just so you know. So May 11th will be our exam number four covering chapters 14, 15, and 16. At this rate, we should finish chapter 16 on Monday, this coming Monday. And we probably will start rolling into chapter 17, which is our very last chapter ever. And again, uh, we will be doing the exam on May 11th. And then I think our final exam, if I'm not mistaken, would be the following week after that, I think. The week of the 18th, I think, sometime. I forget if it's Monday or Wednesday off the top of my head. I almost think it's Wednesday, but I could be wrong. Maybe, or maybe it's the 20 something. I'll have to double check what that is, but for sure. Uh, yeah, the homework dates will be adjusted accordingly. I haven't done it yet, obviously, as well. But uh, is the 20th the final? It sounds about right, maybe just looking at the calendar. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we'll adjust the dates. So we're going to do exam four on the 11th. Uh, which I think is the week before class is over. I think the very last week before finals. And again, I'll cover chapter 16, which we should finish this coming Monday. Uh, in terms of the, the uh, experiment that was originally scheduled for the 11th, I think we may move it up and do it uh, next Wednesday instead. So I think that's the last experiment, if I'm not mistaken, which would be the equilibrium or the shot lays principle type of experiment. So um, depending on where we get in terms of lecture on Monday and Wednesday of next week, we may move that experiment up uh, from the 11th to the 6th. And um, then we'll move the exam to the 11th during lab time. Any questions on any of that stuff? I also do have your last exam graded. I, I do have to release them. I, I have a, to go click that button. So sometime later today, uh, your, your exam uh, three, you should be able to see what you did and all that good stuff. Uh, it won't be right away, but a little bit later today. Um, I just got to double check something before I, I kind of post them, and then they'll be posted sometime today. Any other questions on anything? Uh, we do have a lab today, which is experiment 20, get to the end almost 22, which I think is the second to last experiment. Or there's two more, I think. Um, so experiment 22, which is titrations as well. Uh, so pretty much the same deal as the experiment on Monday. Uh, same type of calculation, everything. You just did a titration in this one with a different acid. So I think this one was acetic acid, which is a weak acid. Uh, but calculation-wise and everything and kind of the information that you'll be given, uh, pretty much the same as what you had on Monday. Uh, there is another video that really describes that, again, I think uh, this particular titration we were doing in experiment 22. So uh, the video will be there for you to watch. And just like before, there will be an image file that has the information filled in that you need to do the uh, calculations. 
and also a PDF file in case you can't see the image. And again, you should use that PDF file or that image, the data in there to do the calculations. And again, they should be very similar to uh, the ones uh, like you did on Monday. Uh, so we'll take a little break now and uh, maybe about uh, 15 minutes or so, I will open up the lab in case you have some questions. But again, uh, it should be very similar to Monday. Make sure you do get that in by five o'clock today, which is the due period and time. Get it in on time. All right, have a good rest of your uh, day. I'll see you in lab if I see you there. If not, have a good weekend and all that good stuff.